was traveling down life's road. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken. As we look at these eight caskets before us, the magnitude of what has happened leaves us awestruck. Death has visited us in a mighty way. That morning, as we look back at that tragic morning, that early morning, and we look at some of those pictures, and we look at these bodies, and we can hardly fathom what has happened. If that would have been you at 5.15 in the morning, dark, driving up I-65, you're driving up and maybe the rest of them are sleeping, I don't know, it was an hour and 15 minutes after they had started their journey, and they're going up the road, and all at once, there's headlights coming across, and all at once they're right there. I don't know what if they had time to say anything. That's really not the point. The point is, if those headlights shine in your face, will you be able to say the last words, Lord Jesus? Or will it say, oh, I wish, and boom, it's over. The covenant by sacrifice. It is the heart of God that we as His creation would come to make a covenant with Him. A covenant better than the one that was made at Mount Sinai. When there was thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake, there was smoke and the people said, I exceedingly fear and tremble. And they told Moses, said, you just go talk to God and you come down and you tell us about it. He said, we just as soon stay away from that. That's the one covenant, the covenant of the law. They were given the Ten Commandments written on tables of stone. This do and thou shalt live. And if you don't, you're going to pay. If you transgress, you die or you make a sacrifice. That's the covenant of the law. The law held up right living but made no provision for right doing other than striving in our own strength. And brethren and sisters, beloved friends and loved ones, I can testify to a time. I know what it's like to try so hard to get better, to get my life together, to be a better person. I would sit under some of those sermons of my dear old grandpa. He would be there with tears running down his cheeks preaching hellfire and brimstone, and I would quiver in my shoes. I would just quiver, and I would say, you know, I've got to get my life together. Something has got to change. I would go out back, and it wasn't long back there with other friends. I had no power. There was nothing there that would give me the overcoming power. This law is ordained of God with a divine plan, and that is to bring us to the end of ourselves. Galatians 3.21 tells us, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law stands, this do and thou shalt live. We stand before a holy God and God is expecting holiness. The law of God doesn't just move to because, well, we slipped here and we slipped there, so God kind of erases a little piece here because we didn't quite match up to that. That's not what the law of God does. The law of God stands firm and it doesn't move for your sin. We had best have an answer. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And that includes me and it includes you. It includes us all. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if we're Jew or Greek. It doesn't matter if we're Amish or Mennonite. It doesn't matter if we're Baptist or what we are. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, when we get to the place with Isaiah, when we get in the presence of a holy God, we say, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of an unclean people. When our heart is broken before God and we get a contrite spirit and all at once we realize that, you know, we are undone without something to pay for our sin. God is very near to a person like that. God wants the law to do its work in our life for one purpose. He does not want to make you miserable. It is never God's intention to stand over you with a big stick and you make a mistake and he wraps you on the head. You make another one and he wraps you on the head again. That's not the God we serve. This is not some kind of a punishment. His banner over us is love and he means it well for us. We'll understand it better by and by, I believe. Someday. He doesn't leave us without a remedy. There is a better covenant than this do and thou shalt live. In Hebrews 
chapter 8, verse 7, it says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the day comes, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant and regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Where do you stand before God this morning? The covenant is made. God will keep his part. I would be foolish to just simply conclude that in a vast sea of people out there that I can't even really discern who's out there, that all of you are just automatically going to heaven. A very good possibility that there is a lot of people here that are not prepared to die. Beloved, it's this serious. In a million years from now, where will you be? It's not just about today. It's not just about the next couple hours. It's not just about a week or two years and then we're free. In a million years from now, where will you be? Do you have an answer? God has provided a remedy. We want to talk about that remedy. You know, he talks here about putting laws into our minds and writing them in our hearts. And he will be to us a God and they shall be to me a people. How does that happen? How does that take place? You know, we see signs sometimes. We're going down the road and we see a railroad sign. It says, stop, look and listen. If we would just be honest enough and real enough with our lives sometimes to just simply stop in our lives and look and listen. What am I hearing coming out of my mouth? As I look around me, what are my interests? What are my passions? What am I drawn to? And a large part of it is just to be able to stop, to stop. In a busy, hurry up world, we're going, we're going. We got things to do, we got places to go. We're just busy, 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 busy. And we don't have time to stop and think, what and where am I going? Take time to evaluate your life. As you think of the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Beloved friends and neighbors, if you're honest with your heart, you evaluate your heart, are those fruits that are flowing from your lives? If not, what are you going to do about it? It's the fruit of the Spirit, and if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. God is not interested, beloved friends and loved ones, in just profession. God is looking for holiness. He's looking for a life. He's looking for a life that reflects and says something about Jesus Christ in our life. You're not going to do it sitting around joking and telling dirty jokes and you're not going to do it like that. You're not going to do it with cheating on your taxes and being unfaithful to your wives and all that. It's not going to work. Those are not the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the works of the flesh and those that do them things shall not inherit the kingdom. How would you feel, beloved brethren and sisters, this morning if you were standing before the Holy Throne of God feeling pretty good about yourself? You know, I've been a church member. I've been doing things right. I've been just doing pretty good. And all at once, here comes all your sins after you. Oh, I forgot about that one. Oh, we best do something about that. All the sin that comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. What shall I do? Just simply acknowledgement that I'm not living right, I believe is the first step to be able to inherit this or to receive that Spirit of God in our hearts and in our minds. God will take the very law of God and write them on our heart. Now as I think of repentance, and I think it's often the missing link in today's professing Christianity, we hear of faith and we hear of being saved, but we hear little about true repentance and godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. For godly sorrow worked with repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Godly sorrow is a sorry that can say so. I believe that when we recognize that we are not living right, we will be willing to say so. We will be willing to say, I am sorry for my sins. I was wrong. I have sinned. I've said it this way already. It is a sorry that is never sorry that it was sorry. I have never ever in all my life heard of somebody that truly repented for their sin and was truly sorry for all his wrong. I have never yet once heard of one man that told me that he was sorry that he confessed that. Never. But there's many a soul 
in hell this morning that is hearing the words, son, remember, son, remember, because he didn't confess. As we think of true repentance and godly sorrow, the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I believe that words have just as much power as when God said, let there be light. And look what happened. There was light. Tremendous things took place. Listen carefully to these words. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. By faith in grace, not just in faith. Dear child of mine, I know your heart. You know, we hear a lot about faith, but faith without a substance to put your faith on is nothing more than positive thinking. We're not interested in talking about just trying to drum up more faith so that we can have enough faith so, we can, so that we can go to heaven because we believe now. It's faith that is focused on the finished work at Calvary. Grace is not just this mushy feeling of, of having some favor with God somehow. Grace is a free gift. It is, we call it the unmerited favor of God when we're something we don't deserve, but it is more than that. It is the divine influence of God. It is God's very spirit in the heart of man that changes hearts and makes us live different. That's what God is looking for. A covenant by sacrifice. We need a sacrifice and we need to make a covenant with God, but there's only one sacrifice that avails before God and we heard about that sacrifice this morning. It is the pure blood of the Lamb is the only thing that God will accept. But that's not just barely accepting. That blood speaks. That blood is more than just barely making it. When God, it says, this is the record that God gave of His Son, He said when He saw the travail of His soul, He was what? He was satisfied. Do you believe this morning that you serve a satisfied God? We serve a God that has been satisfied. It's what we do with that. You will never drum up enough of righteousness. You'll never be able to run fast enough. You'll never be able to do enough of good to satisfy God. But when you believe in the sacrifice that He provided for you, you accept it as your sacrifice, He will accept you. It's almost too hard for us as human beings to grasp when we want to try so hard to pay our way through. We don't want to accept anything for nothing. You know, we're used to paying our way through, beloved brethren and sisters. You cannot. You may not try. If you don't accept the salvation that God provided, you're going to go to hell. It's just that simple. There is no hope outside of the sacrifice that was made for you. Absolutely none. None. Zero. There's a lost soul who's tired of the sinning. And he longs to return to the Lord. I think of my youth days, and all oh, many of you Amish friends that are here, you know my youth, you know how I was. I was not a godly young man. I had a lot of sins, and yes, you have reasons to wonder about my life. But you know, there came a day, somewhere, somehow, by the grace and the mercy of God, that God took all that whole list. There was just vast sin on that thing. I can just picture God taking this and dipping a pen or a quill into the blood, writing upon that, paid in full by the blood of the Lamb. That was my answer. That's the only thing I have to lift up is the blood of Jesus and Him crucified. He's the answer for your sin this morning. Oh, dear friends, I know there's many of you out there that know what I'm talking about there, but there is no greater joy than be able to kneel down beside a broken sinner. There is no greater joy than to kneel down beside a broken sinner and hear them start dumping their sin and as they start dumping their sin, it just comes pouring out. And finally they're silent. And they ask God to forgive them of all their sins and come into their heart and they look up at you. And their eyes are clear and I had one young girl come and looked at me like this way and said, I'm saved. Oh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We dare believe that. This is how He writes the law in our hearts. His Spirit enters the heart and makes all things new as it talks about in Corinthians. 
Behold, old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. This, friends and loved ones, is the new birth. He must be born again. There is no other hope. The Bible says ye must be born again. If you're not born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. And just a couple verses further, it says you won't enter the kingdom of God. You will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. For those of you who are out there this morning and you're not right with God and you are not born again and you make no change, there will come a time where you'll be suffering the pains of hell and you will hear the words, Son, remember, Son, remember throughout eternity. Oh, we don't want to go there. You have an opportunity today. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. When the headlights shine into your windshield, what will your answer be? Every corner of the world needs a savior. Every language needs a copy of God's word. I thought of a very interesting account that I read here some time ago of a man. It was an ungodly sea captain. He was out on sea, and he was getting to the end of his life. He lay in his cabin, and death was staring him in the face. He shrank back in the terrors, and in the dread of eternity took fast hold on him. Captain John Couts said, Williams, get down on your knees and pray for a fella. I've been very wicked, as you know, and I expect I shall go this time. I'm not a praying man, you know, Captain, so I can't pray. I would if I could. Well, then bring a Bible and read it to me a bit, for my rope is about to run out. I have no Bible, Captain. You know I'm not a religious man. Then send for Thomas, the second mate. Perhaps he can pray a bit. The second mate was soon in the presence of the dying Captain. When he said to him, I say, Thomas, I'm afraid. I'm bound for eternity this trip. Get down and pray for me. Ask God to have mercy upon my poor soul. I gladly do it to oblige you, Captain. If I could, but I have not prayed since I was a lad. Have you a Bible then to read to me? No, Captain, I have no Bible. Alas, for the dying sinner, how awful his condition on the brink of eternity without Christ. They searched the ship over for a man who could pray, but they searched in vain. And for a Bible, but none could be found. Until one of the sailors told the captain he had seen a book that looked like a Bible in the hands of a cook's boy, a little fella by the name of Willie Platt. Send it once, said Captain Couts, and see if the boy has a Bible. The sailor hurried off to the boy and said to him, Sonny, have you a Bible? Yes, sir, but I only read it in my own time. Oh, that is all right, my lad. Take the Bible and go to the captain's cabin. He is very sick and he wants a Bible. He thinks he's going to die. Away went Willie Platt with his Bible to the captain's cabin. Have you a Bible, my boy? Yes, Captain. Then sit down and find something in it that will help me, for I'm afraid I'm going to die. Find something about God having mercy on a sinner like me and read it to me. There on the hill called Golgotha. Poor boy. He did not know where to read, but he remembered that his mother had him read the 53rd chapter of Isaiah just before he left home for the voyage. Willie turned to that blessed chapter that so fully sets forth the love and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ in dying for poor sinners such as John Couts and commenced to read. When Willie got to the fifth verse, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and he was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes we are healed. Captain, who was listening for his very life, realized that he was having his last chance of being saved, said, Stop, my lad. That sounds like it. Read it again. Once more, the boy read the blessed words. Aye, my lad, that's good. That's it, sure. These words from the captain encouraged Willie, and he said, Captain, when I was reading that verse at home, Mother made me put my name in it. May I put it in now, just where Mother told me? Certainly, sonny, you put your name in just where your mother told you and read it again. Reverently and slowly, the boy read, He, Jesus, was wounded for Willie Platt's transgressions. He was bruised for Willie Platt's iniquities, and the chastisement of Willie Platt's peace was upon him. And with his stripes, Willie Platt is healed. When Willie had finished, the captain was halfway over the side of his bed, reaching toward the land and said, My boy! 
Put your captain's name in the verse and read it again. John Couts, John Couts. Then the lad slowly read again. He was wounded for John Couts' transgressions. He was bruised for John Couts' iniquities. The chastisement of John Couts' peace was upon him. And with his stripes, John Couts was healed. When the boy finished, the captain said, That will do, my lad. You may go. Then the captain lay back upon his pillow and repeated over and over again those precious words of Isaiah 53, 5, putting in his own name each time. And as he did so, the joy of heaven filled his soul and he was saved. And there is joy, sweet joy. Before John Couts fell asleep in Jesus, he had witnessed to everyone on his vessel that the Christ of God, the man of Calvary, was wounded for his transgressions, bruised for his iniquities, and the chastisement that he rightfully deserved had fallen on the blessed substitute. And with his stripes and the stripes that fell on Jesus, he had been healed. There's one more point that I'd just like to leave. And this is the best part of it all. Now, unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. You know, I thought about that. I tried to imagine, you might say, last Friday morning, Jesus standing on the threshold of heaven and looking down waiting for these. The Bible tells us, and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy. I believe it's talking about the joy of Christ. I believe Jesus is just so joyful. He is excited. It just seems that He can hardly wait to take His children and take them there to that throne and say, here's someone that I've died for and who has trusted in me. I sometimes think that God can just hardly wait to take his children. And you know, I, I thought about this a little bit. That morning, when those people met death and Jesus was there to meet them, and I can just imagine taking him by the hand through glory land, coming over there to that throne. I believe it was glory. And there they met God. And I believe it's going to be a glorious thing for those that believe in Jesus. like to close with Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I beheld lo a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb clothed with white robes and palms in their hand and cried with a loud voice saying salvation to God which sitteth upon the throne to the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell down before the throne on their faces, worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Children.